Welcome again, software engineers, to day 25 of CSC 222. I can see that a number of you survived Thanksgiving break. That's good. <laughs> Looks like a number of folks were able to come back and join us. Uh, I appreciate that. I did ask um, a, a special guest to join us today. Let me just briefly introduce him and let me explain why we're doing this. Uh, this is my good friend, colleague, and boss, Professor Mike Littman. Dr. Littman is Professor and Chair of Computer Science here at Concordia University, Wisconsin. And what I wanted to do is just ask him a series of questions and see if he has anything else to offer, just because he's got a wealth of experience and background. And I think that as a student, you'll find the things he has to say interesting and worthwhile. So. I'm going to stop my share here. Hmm. Uh-oh, question already. So, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we won't talk about um, Chuck Norris in, in front of Dr. Lippman. Is that okay? All right, good. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Mike, do you mind uh, just introducing yourself, background, degrees, and any work experience, anything else you want to say before we get going? Sure. So uh, I'm Mike Littman. I have a PhD in computer science. Um, uh, I would say uh, my background is very programming centric. I started writing software when I was nine years old and uh, that just can ended up being my hobby. <laughs> so when I go away on trips now, that's what I do. I sit there on my laptop and write code for fun. Um, I've uh, started uh, several software companies, um, sold them the last one in uh, December of 2014, I guess November in 20, 2014. So I'm just a lowly professor now. Um, I don't know, what else, what else do you want to know? Oh. <laughs> uh no i, I think that's a professional eater so i've been on tv eating ridiculous amounts of food um my tv name was awesome fat and that was also the name of one of my software companies <laughs> you could you can talk to dr Littman directly about professional eating when you're interested in that what i want to do mike if you don't mind let me just ask some questions regarding what do you think it, it you got a great background, you've worked in the industry, you've had companies, you teach. So I want to ask some questions regarding what students should get out of their college experience. So let me break this into a couple sections. What kind, what concepts or theory do you think a computer science student should know before leaving school? Um, well, I mean, like I said, I'm always going to fall back to programming as a uh, as a skill set, but one thing I like to remind uh, computer science students of is that computer science programming is not computer science. Programming is the tool that the computer scientist uses to solve the solve problems. Effectively, it's the tool we use to tell a computer what to do. Um, so the computer's doing all our heavy lifting for us. So if we're talking about maybe, I don't know, uh, concepts that you get out of your computer science degree that you can take with you out into industry. I think having a well-rounded background in several of the um, you know, uh, the, the big concepts in computer science, whether it's artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, um, databases, uh, you know, a general knowledge of any of those things with maybe an emphasis leaning towards, and maybe this is kind of where you're going with this, but leaning towards having enough background in any of those things to be able to go and teach yourself the new technologies as they come out in terms of what you already know about the old technologies. So when you're sitting in class learning about some relational database and how it was, you know, originally built in the 1960s or something like that, it's not that that's completely useless knowledge. Sure, we have, let's say, better stuff today, but all this better stuff has been built on top of the foundations that were created years and years and years ago. So I think not blowing off those um, theory discussions, I think, is important. You don't have to have a mastery of it, but I think an appreciation of it uh, is certainly important. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Knowing enough about it such that when something new comes out, you can you can at least bootstrap yourself into gaining more information about it. Nice. So what specific skills 
should a computer science student have before they go looking for a job? All right, well, I mean, obviously I'll land again on programming, um, but this is less about uh, um, understanding programming and more about putting in the reps. So if you try to, you know, I like to think about computer programming as kind of being like a sport. And um, unless you've put in a thousand reps or, you know, hundreds of thousands of reps of doing, using a programming language to tell a program or tell a computer what to do, you're not really going to be competent with it. You know, I'm an avid golfer. So, uh, um, you know, I can, Tiger Woods can give me a lesson on how to hit, you know, his famous stinger shot. And uh, I can academically understand what he just did, but until I've tried to do it 10,000 times, I'm probably going to suck at it. So um, I think having, putting in reps with that tool that we use to solve, uh, solve problems, I think is important if we're going to certainly become a computer programmer at some level. And I think this is a software engineering class. So at least some of the folks in here might be side, they're going to go out and be on the programming side of software engineering. Um, but I, I guess it's also, uh, if we're thinking about just applied skill sets, while you're still a student playing around with technologies that are out that aren't necessarily being introduced to you in the classroom. I might say that maybe 90% of what you learn, you're not going to learn in the classroom, but you <laughs> need to put yourself in positions to go and learn that stuff. What the classroom is going to teach you is going to teach you how to learn. And it's going to give you that foundational stuff I mentioned a few minutes ago you know, which is going to give you the, the uh, enough background in the stuff that you can go and teach yourself things, but you're not going to have every new technology, every single thing you're going to need uh, for the job that you're applying for next week handed to you in the classroom. It's just not practical. Great. So what was working in the software industry like for you? I know you started and sold a couple companies, but you want to just share what, what was it like working out there well i think when you first start one thing you realize pretty quickly is uh, i think computer programmers um typically think we know everything and then when you start dealing with real human beings the people who want a solution to a problem who might be business people who are probably far less technical than you are you learn very quickly that you don't necessarily know what the user wants just because you think it's important doesn't mean it's important to the user. Um, and you also learn very quickly how important um, fact finding is uh, before you ever start writing software. So when you think about your job as a, as a software engineer, computer programmer of, of some, some flavor, let's say, uh, you know, you think you go into the office and eight hours a day, you're sitting there banging on the keys. And that's how most computer programmers start. They just start by opening up the text editor and starting to write code. You know, well, once you get into it a little bit, you're gonna realize that I don't know what problem I'm actually solving. Where you should have spent significant time figuring out A, what does the user want? Um, making sure you're all on the same page with that stuff, um, so on and so forth. So I, I suppose if there was one thing I learned in industry is that, uh, the my old style of just sitting down and writing code just because doesn't really work when you're uh, as soon as you get to projects even of medium size and especially when you have a client that's not yourself involved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah great you're playing into our hand because i certainly focus on those kinds of things too understanding the problem and there's a lot more than just doing the coding the coding's important obviously but some other things involved too so beyond that, is there anything else you wish you would have known or learned before you got your first job? Well, I guess I would, well, you said besides that. I think I think I'd really re-emphasize even that just the, the requirements document piece. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I towards the well, pretty pretty quickly, but I got burned many times on the way but you learn that that requirements document effectively functions as your contract with the client. You know, it's almost like a, a checklist of this is what I'm promising I'm going to do. Um, and unless you nail that and you make sure that the client and you are on the same page, uh, it's a recipe for disaster and mm -hmm. you're going to get disappointed over and over again. And you're going to feel like you could never make the client happy 
because you never actually knew what the client wanted. You know, you sit in these meetings and, you know, you nod and smile and, you know, you might take a note here and there, but in the end, you never actually captured it. And then you always have those conversations where the client says, well, why doesn't it do this? Mm -hmm. You never asked me to do that. Well, yes, we did. Didn't this mean that? Um, the, the planning process is just so important to the point that programming is almost unimportant. Um, I mean, there's some software engineering tools out there that if you, you know, use their magical language for uh, describing the problems you're solving, in the end, it writes 80% of the code for you. Uh, and then you just have to go in and do some of the integration. So, I mean, the planning process, as boring as it might seem, is the most important part. Hmm. Great. So let's go back further in time. Why did you decide to major in computer science? Yeah, I don't know if that was ever actually a, there was never a question. Uh, yeah, I just, I, it was, I, as soon as computers started, um, being on people's desks at home, you know, I, I was fascinated by it and I would pull them apart and rebuild it and sit down and learn how to do stuff on it. So, I mean, it was just a matter of where I was going to go as opposed to, as opposed <laughs> to what I was going to major. I, I was never one of the types of flip-flopping uh, on majors, although, you know, I, it, that seems very common nowadays. And also there's a lot of hybrid majors where computer science is a part of it and i think that's a you know a very interesting direction that our field is going where computer science isn't just important for the you know professional computer scientist that's going to sit there staring at a computer all day long skills that you learn are so appropriate for so many other fields that you can do almost anything with it. There's a lot of uh, schools that have, especially in like biomedical engineering stuff, there's a lot of healthcare things and um, with uh, computer science. But I guess for me, I never, I never had that conversation or needed to be talked into it, or so I guess I'm a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> so why is computer science fun for you? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, again, it's, it's just like my hobby, you know, I, I, um, I probably do it less now, but you know, when I was, um, you know, I, I would, I would be at work and I would be either writing code or talking about technology or whatever at work. And then I come home and I play with technology and, you know, now I do tons of stuff with virtual reality or I'm playing PlayStation or, or, you know, I, I go on trips, I sit there and write software. I might put Netflix on and, and work on some fun project, uh, some utility that I'm um, uh, working on. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It's mindless fun, I guess, for me <laughs> now. It's in, yeah, I don't know. I just always felt, it, it's similar to like when somebody says they love baseball. So and you ask them how, you know, what do you find fun about baseball? You just, I like playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although I only like doing stuff that I actually enjoy. So like user interfaces, I don't like building user interfaces. <laughs> so that's not fun. <laughs> right. So a lot of people find computer science difficult and hard. And I think many students, even though they like computer science and have an aptitude for it, they find it, it's hard, it's difficult. So why is computer science so hard? Oh, I have a good answer for this one. Oh, good. I have a great answer for this one. <laughs> now, even your worst students in this class, I promise you, are amazing problem solvers. Human beings are amazing problem solvers. God created us to be like that. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that we are so good at solving problems that we have a lot of trouble articulating how we solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, to become a good computer... We spend every day of our life talking to other human beings. So we've gotten pretty good at explaining ourselves to other human beings or to fill in the blanks when another human being is telling us less than optimal directions or something. You know, we can give somebody directions to a party and say, oh, it's like the third or fourth light down. There's going to be a gas station on the side of the road. And I think on the second house on the left, there'll be some kind of car in the driveway. Human beings, we can fill in the gaps, you know, because we're, we're smart. Um, and we've spent our entire life working with other human beings, and we're good at that. 
The problem is we have not spent our whole life talking to a computer and computers are dumb. They only do what we tell them to do. And the problem is, is that since we have trouble breaking problems down into the smallest little steps, because we have trouble articulating how we solve problems, we're never going to be able to tell a, pro a, a computer step-by-step -step instructions how to accomplish something. That's the difficult part of becoming a computer scientist, is retraining the way we think to slow our mind down and break problems into smaller steps. And, you know, I, I, I use it in, in some of my classes, like with game programming stuff, you know, those of you who are, you know, big video game players, and you look at the most complicated video game out there with all the explosions and all this stuff, well, that solution is a trivial solution compared to the things that a human being just does every single day. You know, as you're walking down the hall, you know, you're bobbing and weaving in and out of people while you're texting on your phone because, you know, walking, which is this incredibly complicated thing, isn't even worth your full attention. So, you know, really the things we ask computers to do are simplistic compared to the things that a human being does on a daily basis that we can't even we don't even give our full attention to. So it's really that that idea of translating the way that we think about the solution to problems rather than just saying, hey, I'm, I'm happy with the result. Now we need to understand how did we get to the result and be able to break it down into the small steps so we can tell a computer what to do. That's what makes it hard. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely. That's a great answer. That's good. Yeah. Well, I told you ahead of time it was going to be great. <laughs> Why did I doubt? <laughs> so I get a sense for why you think computer science is fulfilling. Do you ever find computer science frustrating? Um, well, I mean, I, I think certainly, um, you know, technology, uh, you know, when it doesn't work the way we want it to work, you know, obviously that can be uh, frustrating when there's a, um, um, let, me, let me give a practical example. Um, that I think will be uh, uh, helpful for, for this group. So I mentioned a little bit ago, I, I do a lot of stuff with virtual reality. And, um, you know, what I would say is the, the best VR experience out there is uh, from Meta. The Meta Quest 2 is probably the best experience of the Quest Pro, but basically the, the, the Quest operating system for VR in their headset. Well, recently, another company um, out of China came out with a kind of a competing device called the Pico 4. Pico 4 is, you know, it's a knockoff of the Quest 2. Everything about it looks identical. But every piece of hardware in the Pico 4 is just a little bit better than the Quest 2. It's two years newer, right? Better optics, better, it's lighter weight, all, all these things. So you might say, well, why would I get a Quest 2 when I can, if you can find a way to get it, because they don't sell it in the U.S., but why would I get a Quest 2 when I can get the Pico 4 for basically the same price and it's the better machine? Now, if I had both of those sitting in front of me today and somebody said you can grab one of them, 100% I would grab the Quest 2. Hardware only takes you so far. The best hardware in the world does not necessarily mean the best end user experience. Mm -hmm. Software is what makes the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I thought it was you know, poignant for this particular yeah. class. The software on the Quest, which used to be MetaBot Oculus years ago. <laughs> so the software in the, when you put on a Quest headset, you're using this operating system built for VR with a whole bunch of stuff that um facebook meta people uh, have put in there it's it's a very uh mature uh, experience it's the way that you want to experience vr inside of a headset the pico 4 tried to mimic that but they have nowhere near the infrastructure for it they don't have the media partners for it where you can just go on and watch an nba game in vr as if you're sitting on the court in two seconds there's so so really I mean I I'm staring across my room right now I have a Pico Four hanging on a uh, um, I, I keep my VR headsets on like a, a coat hang, coat rack so I've been hanging on a coat rack over there and I don't remember the last time I put it on it's the technology is amazing the hardware is amazing but the software just leaves you wanting so so that's an example of where I think technology does disappoint you 
Uh, because as human beings, we always think, oh, a faster processor must be better. More RAM must be better. We, we tend to, you know, it's kind of, you know, I guess humans were greedy. We just want faster everything, bigger everything. Um, and we forget with technology how important that software piece is. And really, Apple has been doing this for years. Sure, they charge you an arm and a leg for the hardware, but Apple historically has not had the, the fastest processors in their computer, the fastest speed memory, things like that. But since they control both the hardware and the software side of um, their ecosystem, you basically get a product that for the most part just works and it works really well together. Whereas if you build your own computer at home, you know, people like to demonize Microsoft and I've always thought that's funny. Um, you know, who's solving the harder problem, Microsoft or Apple? Apple's writing an operating system that runs on the computers that they build. Microsoft's writing a piece of software that has to run on a zillion different uh, hardware configurations, almost none of which do they build. Mm -hmm. Pretty shocking how well Windows actually actually works when you look at it from that perspective. Um, but the point is, is that if you're a PC gamer and you're somebody who likes to build the computers and that kind of stuff, you might spend hours and hours and hours researching, you know, I'm going to get, you know, the, the DDR5 uh, uh, RAM and I'm going to overclock it to this and I want the 16 core, this, that, or the next thing. And we're going to overclock that. I'm going to put liquid cool cooling in it and all this stuff. You do all this thing, all this stuff. And then you realize that your benchmarks are 15% slower than you thought they were going to be because two of your pieces of hardware just aren't playing nice together uh, or the motherboard has some sort of uh, bobble, you know, throttles back one of the buses or something like that. You know, the things that we think is just going to make it better doesn't necessarily make it better unless the software compl uh, complements it. Mm -hmm. So really there's just that popped up. So the example of me being frustrated from technology popped up very recently uh, <laughs> with that, where I put that headset on and it's like, oh, this looks great. It's so light. It's so much better than the Quest 2. It's not pulling down on the front of your face, all these things. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, what am I going to do now? There's nothing to do in here. Mm -hmm. So many of the best things to do in VR are free. Like, you know, I can spend 10 hours in VR just watching YouTube VR, like 360 tours of London and things like that. Well, guess what apps not available on the app store for Pico? YouTube <laughs> VR. <laughs> so that one's out. <laughs> um, none of my NBA games are on there. Although I, I can, they have a, some kind of special agreement with, I know some company that has a dance game or something like that. So apparently if you want to do the real-time dance VR competition thing, Pico's where it's at. Um, so that's not really my cup of tea, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Now that's a great illustration. Uh, let's jump ahead to some things that I know will interest the students, especially when they graduate. What is your sense? What is the job market for new computer science graduates right now? Um, well, I would say the job market at this exact moment is a little bit on the, the, the skids just because we're in an economic downturn. There's less available jobs, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say out of all of the professions, computer science is probably one that is least impacted. Uh, by downturns in that. We certainly were least impacted by COVID. Uh, in fact, COVID created a very interesting scenario, I think, for, um, uh, for industry, for graduating students. And that is, historically, you would come out, you'd apply for a job, and then you'd move where the job is. Uh, and you show up to work every day of the week, yada, 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 all that stuff. Well, out of necessity with the, the whole COVID thing, you know, people were working at home. So even companies uh, that, you know, we have a company that we work closely with uh, here in Wisconsin uh, named Acuity. Uh, they're an insurance company. They're kind of the Google of the Midwest. They have like rock climbing walls and stuff like that in there. But Acuity was always very much about, we want everybody here on our campus and you know, it's all about the, the acuity lifestyle or whatever. And they were just starting to think about like beta testing a work from home one day a week type type thing uh, before COVID. Well, now everybody, nobody has to come into the office. We have a former student who now lives in Indiana and still works for uh, acuity. We have another student who travels around the world um, three months at a clip 
living in different countries, working for a company in New York City. Um, so, you know, the, what's happened in our industry is we now have the uh, luxury of not necessarily having to shop for jobs in our own backyard. Uh, and it's also created a weird thing with um, salary. If you are somebody who is, um, uh, if you're a company on one of the coasts, say New York City, um, you know, San Francisco, whatever, you know, where salaries are significantly higher than they are in the Midwest. Well, if somebody right out of school in New York City might make, uh, let's say, $90,000 a year. And that same person coming out of school in the Midwest makes $70,000 a year for the same job. Well, now all of a sudden that person in the Midwest can work remotely and make $80,000 <laughs> working for the company in New York. So then it puts pressure on some of the companies in the Midwest to now have to pay higher so their talent doesn't leak. I mean, we have people living in Milwaukee, but working in New York City. Um, so it has created a very interesting thing. And I, and I think that's going to continue sliding in that direction. Um, we are seeing some interesting stuff recently uh, with the, uh, the whole Twitter takeover thing. And Elon Musk wants everybody to come back to work physically in the office. And and I, I think there's something to be to be said uh, for that. You know, you uh, we are, I think, in general, more productive when we're in person. Um, and there's conveniences of being online like this, and sometimes it's just the way it has to work. But you know, we I have what? How many people do I have in here? We have, I see 22 people. So you know, 17 of you, 18 of you have your screens off, and I bet you out of those, at least five are probably got Netflix on on the side or 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 whatever. You know, that's just the world we live in. I do the same thing. If I'm sitting in a Zoom meeting, I'm checking email and stuff. You know, we're just not, we're not paying attention. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think our, our job prospects for graduating computer science students is, are very strong because there's so many jobs and you don't necessarily have to relocate. But I think that the onus on us to find ways of time management and being productive when we don't have somebody standing over our shoulder is also pretty important. Um, and I'm not sure that um, the younger generation now, or really any of us, I mean, we all, we're, we're all lazy at some level, right? And when somebody's standing over your shoulder, it's, you know, you kind of feel like you have to <laughs> you pay attention or something. And it's easy when you're sitting at home, you just feel like you don't get anything done. So it's a it's an interesting thing. I, I'm, in many ways, I'm envious of uh, uh, some of our students who do work uh, remotely for places and seem to have great time management skills and stuff. Because I would say I really don't. I basically have to drag myself to a coffee shop if I want to get anything done. Because if I sit at home, I'll do something else. You know, the VR headset sitting there, my TV sitting there. You know, immediately I'm doing, I'm distracted. I'm doing something else, and you know, so. Good job market, and we're going to bounce back quicker than anybody else will. Yeah. Uh, but you haven't noticed an interesting thing in the last year, probably out of all the all the stocks, tech stocks have probably gotten beaten down the worst. Um, but the whole market's crap right now, so it doesn't really matter. But I think we'll come back pretty strong. So I think uh, tech is an exciting thing to be in. But if you're graduating in a week, um, you know, it's the, the job market is, isn't quite as good as it was two years ago. Yeah. yeah. Good. So how, what's your advice? How should a new graduate get a job, look for a job? What should they do? Uh, well, definitely uh, start looking for internships. Um, I mean, I would, I would start right after your freshman year, that first summer. Um uh, but get an internship uh, uh, somewhere. A lot of times, the, your first job turn is the your your internship turns into your first job. Um, and one thing I tell I I'd like to tell students, you know, stay poor for as long as you can. And uh, rather than go out and compete for internships, we have one company that says we have two internship slots, and you're competing with 600 other people. I like to tell people figure out what your dream company would be to work on, or what you think your dream company would be. Um, go to their website, find out some decision maker there, the department or whatever that you think you'd be interested in working in and, uh, you know, shoot them an email, say, Hey, you know, I'm really interested. I like, you know, I, I'm interested in your company. What you guys do is really cool. You know, I wonder if I can come in and job shadow sometime, 
you know, and then maybe you reach back out after that and say, hey, you know, I, I really want to get involved. I don't know if you guys have internships or not, but, you know, I'm willing to work for free. Now, the, the, the secret sauce there is, is that one, you know, most of these bosses, they don't know the human resources people. So they don't realize that you're not allowed to work for free. But all they hear is, ah, free labor. So what ends up happening is this, sure, you know, let's get you on a project and, you know, it'll be for one of your classes or whatever. And they get you in there and maybe you end up hating it. But if you like it, they're pretty quickly going to end up having to pay you because HR is going to scream at them. Um, and then you have your internship, but you built it yourself rather than having to go and shop around. So I'd encourage you to get an internship sooner rather than later. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with applying for a bunch of internships, but don't just limit yourself to the internships that are being advertised. Sometimes you can create your own uh, scenario. I, and I've seen that happen a lot of times. Yeah, good advice. Um, last one, and then I'll see if you want to add anything. So, Dr. Littman, what are your words of wisdom to a student? How do they survive and even thrive in any computer science class? Well, I guess I'd say, and this is really for any major as a starting point, you know, a school is your full-time job. Um, I realize the world's changed a little bit now, but when I was in school, uh, um, you know, it was our full-time job, but I didn't come to school with credit card debt and car payments and all this stuff. And, um, I mean, Dr. Locklear, they didn't have cars yet. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used so, to it. Okay. <laughs> oh, and for the record, at the beginning of this thing, he introduced me as his boss. Well, before I was his boss, he was my boss. <laughs> It's he's gotten older. He's gotten older. He's got grandkids, all that stuff. So it's uh, <laughs> he's been doing this longer than me. So he he hired me uh, in 2006. Uh, <laughs> and I guess I've been doing it for three years now. But uh, yeah. Yeah. so it's it's a flip floppy thing. But yeah, he's old. It's a <laughs> um, but yeah. So you know, young people today, it seems like they're coming to school and they already have two jobs and car payments, all this. I mean, life is getting in the way. So, I mean, it might be impractical for me to say, treat school as your full-time job, but that's really the way to, to become successful. You have to just throw your entire effort into your, uh, your degree, because right now you're, you're young, you have the energy uh, to do all these things. You, uh, pulling an all-nighter is not necessarily recommended, but it's possible for you, where my ears are ringing at 1030 at night. You know, <laughs> so it's, uh, um, yeah, so, you know, make school your full-time gig, take it seriously, realize you're paying a lot of money, and that's an investment in your future successes, um, rather than just kind of get through school and look at it as an opportunity to party or whatever. Not that you can't have a social life, but try to choose education first and let, and do that whole time management thing, specifically the computer science stuff, um, this kind of goes back to, uh, you know, again, I, I see everything through the lens of programming, yet I'm a big advocate that computer programming is not computer science. It's, uh, you know, it's a tool that we use, but if you, you know, if it, it's kind of like a superpower where, you know, if you can wield that sword, you can solve a lot of problems and you can imagine new problems, uh, new solutions to problems that, you know, might present themselves to you. So really bearing down and getting good at computer programming, even if you decide, you know what, this might not be what I want to do day in, day out. Just having that skill set, I think, opens a lot of doors for you and opens a lot of options for you. And there's so many entrepreneurial opportunities out there now where you can become part of a startup company or something. And just understanding the world of of tech and computer programming might make you be that business person that's the liaison between the real business people and the, the, the tech geeks. So having the real tech skills, I think, is pretty important, but that takes time. You know, you can't just academically learn how to program and, you know, uh, uh, try to study the night before the exam and expect to come in and do well. Or you might be able to do that on, in some class that's very much memorization based or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah okay anything else you'd like to share or add well, i guess not that not that i can think of okay do you really stay up to 10 30 
<laughs> well, says the old guy. <laughs> well, Tabby, yeah, Tabby and I, we, we watch shows in the evenings pretty often. We have to kind of keep tabs with each other to see who's falling asleep first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, what's, yeah. what's funny is that happens a lot with us these days and she likes the show called the the middle that she uh uh she watches you know reruns four thousand times on and there's uh this episode was on the other day where they keep trying to start watching this show and they keep falling asleep over and over and over again they, they, they never can get through it they wake up and somebody like the other the other day, Tabby, my wife, had fallen asleep, and she thought she had just closed her eyes for a second, and you know, she said, "Oh, I, I, th I don't think I missed anything." And then she looks at the screen. She's like, "Who, who's Glenn?" It's a new <laughs> character had just like been introduced like a half hour ago. <laughs> she was just meeting him for the first time. But anyway, that that show, uh, you know, really put into perspective that that's real. <laughs> when you're 19 20 21 years old you have uh because i used to pull all-nighters all the time i would just stay up and write software in my my dorm room and things but now it's like that's not even a thing <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not even close <laughs> oh excellent okay well dr lemon thank you so much i appreciate you joining us and at least the students didn't have to listen to me the entire time today so thanks mike all uh, right all right. Yep. Bye bye. Later. Later. So, everyone, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I usually like to bring in some guest speakers, and I had a couple students scheduled, and just uh, times did not work out, but I will have at least one more. Hopefully you got a little bit out of it and it was totally unrehearsed, but I think you saw Dr. Lipman say a couple things that we even talk about in this class as being important. Thank you for putting up with that. Let me just do a logistical thing or two and then we better stand up um, for sure. So thank you, first of all, for coming back after Thanksgiving break. I hope that you did have a good Thanksgiving break. I don't know what's worse, you know, having that break or not having that break. I think it's worse to not have a break, but now you got to come back and we got to pump through two weeks and then finals, but just do it. In general, uh, assignments that you should see on Blackboard, assignment 21, this is that quiz on the Fred Brooks article that's due today. Please, if you haven't done that already, do that sometime today. Um, sprint two, the documentation, the implementation documentation, and the actual project are due Wednesday. There's a little bit of slack there, but don't let that go too much beyond Wednesday because you're going to have to start immediately on the final sprint after that. You got some feedback on sprint one. Um, I'm trying to just one person in the team needs to submit either the project or the document. And I'm trying to copy the comments to everybody else. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. So if you're a team member who didn't submit something and you don't see comments associated with it, ask the person who submitted it just so you're all on the same page with what's happening and what needs to be done there. Oops, sorry. Um, CNCS 11, we'll say a little bit more about that today. Uh, the 10th commandment and the 10th aspect of professionalism. Um, that's going to be due next Monday. Thinking ahead, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask every member of the team to assess grade, if you will, every other member of the team. This is not going to be the other team members grade. It's just for me to make sure I understand how much effort folks are putting into it. It would do no good to just give everybody a pass nor do any good to fail everybody except for you. So I'll ask you to think about how can I honestly assess myself, my contribution, and everybody else's contribution also. One thing you'll discover doing an industry is assessment, self-assessment. 
it's very common. Uh, when I worked for Hewlett Packard every twice a year, every six months, uh, we had to do a self-assessment. Then you met with your boss one time, and then you met with the boss's boss another time. Go through that. Uh, they'd give you constructive criticism. So it's good to be able to do this. And that's you don't see it yet. It will be assignment. It is coming up. Oh, let's let's start here. All right. Say, look, oh, and my watch says time to stand. I should look that up. How come our watches tell us that we need to stand and you stand up for a minute and an hour? I think that's good. All right. Are you ready? Let's take a break. So stand up if you haven't already. Walk around and we'll do this again in a minute. Aha, uh -huh. I think it's been a minute. Hmm. Uh, if you don't know what my background is, this is the Willis Tower in Chicago. Uh, it used to be called the Sears Tower, and everybody still calls it the Sears Tower, too. It's the tallest building in Chicago, tallest building in the Midwest. Only a couple buildings in the U.S. that are taller, the new WTC in New York, and a pretty pretty tall building. Um, I like Chicago. My wife and I go there uh, fairly often, and um, I never mind driving in Chicago. People think I'm weird. There are 10 million people in the Chicagoland area, so I expect slowdowns and things like that. But the one thing that's interesting is... I sort of have a sense for what Chicagoans are going to do when they're driving. I know when I'm going to be cut off. I know when somebody's going to do whatever. I don't like driving through downtown Milwaukee because I never know what they're doing down there. That's always a surprise to me. Speaking of teams, you weren't or you're not being the bozo on your team, are you? When I die, I want my group project members to lower me into my grave. So they can let me down one last time. Yeah, that's a pretty common refrain that you hear from folks who survived group projects as an undergraduate. Um, from what I, the sense that I get and the feedback that I get, vast majority of folks are working together as members of a team. Good, keep it up. And if you slack just a tiny bit, pick it up just not with an all-nighter. All right. So we're up to my 10th and the last one I'll foist upon you, aspect of professionalism. My 10th one is being helpful. You won't understand the bow tie reference. This is the reference to the president of Concordia University, Wisconsin, whose trademark is the bow tie. But Really, as a um, college president, he's an extremely helpful person. I never could figure out how he could find the time to interact with so many students, staff, and faculty members. And of course, nobody goes to the president of a university with a compliment. It's always some kind of gripe and complaint. But he always seemed to take the time to genuinely listen and be concerned and then do something about it. That's definitely a characteristic of a professional, being helpful. 
Paul said the same thing to the church in Corinth. There's no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people, for I know your eagerness to help. I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. Yeah, being helpful is really beneficial, an aspect of professionalism. Now, how's that going to relate to the 10th commandment? Remember, Lutherans and Martin Luther divided up what many people call just as a single commandment, coveting everything. We saw in the ninth commandment, covering our neighbor's house, which really means inheritance and good name. And now everything else in the 10th commandment, you should not covet your neighbor's wife, and there's a whole litany of things, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. How am I going to relate being helpful to this? Well, it will be helpful to take a look at the positive aspect. Probably have to do that next time because I got to show you this first. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's Wi-Fi. <laughs> if you read the Dilbert cartoon before, it's a fairly common running gag, right? Confusing Wi-Fi and wife in a number of different ways. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Before Thanksgiving, we talked about Roman numeral 19, ethical software engineering. We saw there's a connection between ethics and professionalism. And I use that funny word, ought. Ethics is how we ought to do things. If it's software engineering, how we ought to develop software. And Dr. Lippman can st stay up all night developing stuff. I don't think that's how you ought to do it. But he's usually just doing that for fun. Does that strike you as weird? I mean, the guy just creates... <laughs> it's obviously not weird. <laughs> all right, we're up to capital I, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. We did the week before Thanksgiving. So let's just say, I just want to say two additional things about ethical software engineering. First, the EULA. We saw this before. The acronym means End User License Agreement. The license agreement, we talked about licensing software. Usually companies call it the EULA, End User License Agreement. What is it? It's the ethics of how we ought to use software. So not just as a developer, but how do we use software? And as a developer, this interests us because part of deployment is creating the licensing, the license agreement for the user. And this does inform the user how the user ought to use the software. And as always, I'm just going to pull out my four transcendentals, truth, beauty, goodness, and community. I had a couple other questions that are going to ask Dr. Lippman. I did want to get into a Christian worldview, but I, I know he's in tune the same as I am and the same as Professor Tallman is there and all the other computer science faculty that I know at any of the Concordia's really connecting these ideals in a Christian worldview to the things that we do. And if we're using somebody else's software, we need to think about these also. For example, ever read a license agreement? You'd be surprised. By opening this package, you agree, dot, 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 you will not make copies or export to despotic nations. You will submit to strip searches in your home. <laughs> While I haven't seen that, you'd be surprised at the rights you are giving up by installing some software on your machine. By installing some software on your machine, you give a total right to privacy. The company claims that they can look at anything on your machine. And I think some do. Wow. Okay, this one I haven't seen. 
Just to review some things we said when we talked about deployment in unit two and the idea of a license. Remember that software is usually not sold. We almost always give people money for it, but that doesn't mean we own it. We're not technically buying it. Instead, it is licensed for use. The license gives us permission to use it subject to certain conditions, subject to certain restrictions. And yeah, oftentimes it deals with how many machines can you use the software on, not, re not reverse engineering it, and many other issues. Permission to use with conditions and restrictions. In the interest of time, I won't um, jump into either one of these, but I just encourage you, the next time you install a piece of software, rather than just clicking through, yeah, I read, yeah, I read, yeah, I read, it will take a little bit of time. And of course, couched in legalese, it will be not obvious everything that's being said, but some things will be. I would just encourage you to read what they say. Um, actually, I think this is HPE, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and this is just one aspect of the huge agreement. If you abide by this agreement, Hewlett Packard Enterprise grants you a non exclusive, non-transferable license to use one copy of the version or release of the accompanying software for your internal purposes only, subject to any... Blah, blah, blah. You're used to subject to the following restrictions. You may not use software to provide services to third parties. Note what that's saying. They don't want you setting up a business based on this software. It's for my use, my company's use, but if I'm now going to use this as the basis for supporting other people, well, that's not allowed. Interesting. You may not make copies and distribute, resell, sublicense the software. You may not download and use patches, enhances, bug goods, similar updates, unless you have a license to the underlying software. You may not copy or make it available on a public or external distributed network. You may not allow access on an intranet, intranet, unless it's restricted to authorized users. You may not modify, reverse engineer, disassemble, decrypt, decompile, and make derivative works of the software. Interesting. Final issue under ethical software engineering. I mentioned in passing in a couple of different places, this idea of liability. What if something goes wrong? You're making, a, you're making software for somebody else. And I appreciated Dr. Lippman earlier today talking about the importance of that requirements document. Now, what he means by requirements is what we mean by both requirements and specifications. That's very important because, as Dr. Littman said, that becomes a de facto. It becomes a, yeah, what does it become? It becomes the de facto contract between you and the company that employs you. What happens if something goes wrong? What if your software causes problems? What if a bug causes inaccurate computation? What if some kind of failure takes out some other system? Your business could face a costly lawsuit if a defect in your software leads to property damage or physical injury. Here's what you should know about software product liability and how to protect your business. I'm just going to briefly pour into that site. You won't have to remember anything specific about this, but do remember in general that, wow. Another aspect of software engineering is, what about liability? I create this for somebody else. What if something goes wrong? Could I be sued? What are the consequences? Yeah, there's uh, why a software defect could mean trouble for your small business. Yep, yep. By the way, 
This is why companies who produce software do get insurance, you know, errors and omissions insurance to help pay for legal costs and anything else incidentals that might come up in this. <laughs> I was glad Dr. Lippman said, you know, coding, that's really exciting, but that's just a small fraction of what goes on in software engineering. <laughs> <clears throat> Last night, I dreamed I was swimming in an ocean of orange soda. Cool. Yeah, but unfortunately, it was just a fantasy. Fantasy? It was just a fantasy. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Good. Thank you. See, that's the way. That's what an A student always says. Thank you, Nate. I liked it. <laughs> the very last phase of software engineering, the maintenance phase. Let's introduce it today, and we'll have other things to say as we go on, as you can imagine. Maintenance phase. Now, we've listed the six phases in order, but they're not always done in order. We saw the idea of scrum with sprints, et cetera, this cyclic development process. But to learn about it and understand it, we'll just list them in the order. Phase six, maintenance. Here's the definition that we're going to use. Any change to the product, don't forget, a software product is code and documentation. Any change to the product, either code or documentation, after the product has been deployed. Any change after deployment. And again, by deployed, we mean either delivered to the client or put into production. If it's something internally, if it's a DevOps, DevOps model. Any change to the product, any change to the product, any change to the code, any change to the documentation, any change to both after the product has been deployed. That by definition is maintenance. Think of maintenance as similar to what happens the service after the sale of a car. Um, this is kind of strange. I have never purchased a brand new car. Um, not for lack of trying. Tried it a couple of times. It just never worked out. Now, don't feel bad for me. I've got plenty of stuff here. But when you buy, and this is what they tell me, when you buy a brand new car, it comes with a warranty. Yeah. If something happens to that car during the warranty period, the warranty is supposed to cover it. Right? Yeah. So that's like maintenance. Anything happens to the software after the user has it, that's maintenance. Guess what? Maintenance has to be planned into a product. Everything has to be managed. Everything has to be planned. Maintenance has to be planned into a product. My daily driver is an 11 year old Mercedes Benz. Uh, the only way I can drive a Mercedes is you buy them used, they're really cheap, and you have to be able to fix them yourselves because it's really expensive to go to a Mercedes dealer. But when that Mercedes was sold new, I can tell you that a large fraction of the cost of that car was held back by Mercedes-Benz just to pay warranty claims. If it were possible to buy a car without a warranty, I know they're called used cars, but if it was possible to buy a new car without a warranty, you'd easily be paying 15% less, if not more. So the manufacturer says, okay, here's all our sunk costs. Here's all our manufacturing costs. Here's all our you know, ancillary costs. And now here's another 20% added on. Why? Because we know. When that Tesla comes back, we're going to have to fix it. 
During the first unit, actually, I think uh, it might have been the end of the first week, second week at the latest, I mentioned that two thirds of total project cost happens in the maintenance phase. At the time, you didn't believe me, and you may still not believe me. I do see folks claiming that only 50% is maintenance. Whether it's 50, half, or 67, two-thirds, that's a significant amount of cost in the maintenance phase. Yow. All right. What's the goal of maintenance? You say, well, that's easy. Fix it. Ah, hold on. The goal of maintenance is to modify the existing software while preserving its integrity. What's that mean? I'll explain. Modify the existing software while preserving its integrity. Gordon Kelly, you don't have to know this person at all, but since iOS 4 or something, he's got a column he writes, is it 4? I don't even know where it's at. I don't know, someplace. And after every release of iOS, he creates a little article. iOS, whatever, 16.1, should you upgrade? Great question. Great question. Many of you may be in the habit of upgrading things as soon as the upgrade comes out. That's because you live dangerously and if things go wrong, it doesn't bother you. Okay, I, I don't do that iOS 16, what's he call it? Uh, coincidental. No, maybe it's not here, but somewhere he called it like a bug fest or something. Wow, iOS 16 was really buggy. Oh, don't worry, 16.1 fixes all those bugs. <laughs> Software engineers, we know better than that. Oh. What do I mean by preserving its integrity? You need to make a change to correct, or we'll see some other examples in a minute, without mucking up anything else. If you correct one bug and that correction introduces two other bugs, you didn't do maintenance right. Goal, modify while preserving. That's hard. All right, there are four major types of maintenance, believe it or not, four identifiable types of maintenance. Let's surface skim these today, and then we'll do a deeper dive later. The first type of maintenance is corrective maintenance. Corrective maintenance is designed to fix faults, correct bugs. As the name implies, corrective maintenance. There was something wrong with the product. There were bugs in the product after it was deployed. Darn. You got to fix those bugs. And we saw in the last unit that debugging, the goal of debugging is to correct the bug without introducing new bugs. <laughs> I'm not picking on Windows, every system, okay? The, the current incarnation of Windows, Windows 11, and they always have, you know, versions and they went to this funny naming convention, 22H2. This is the latest release of Windows. It has a few errors. This one cracks me up. You can't safely eject media while task manager is open. Task manager is a system applet. If task manager is open, if the window's open on your desktop, you cannot do the safely eject media. You want to get rid of your flash drive? Right click, it won't, no, won't do it. Funny. You probably have heard of certain CPUs, the Ryzen 7000s having performance issues with this specific release of Windows 11. And that follows on the heels of problems with certain video cards. And then many people experience when trying to install this update to Windows, 
this very cryptic installation error. Yeah, and then it just hangs. Those need to be corrected. The second type of maintenance is called perfective maintenance. Perfective maintenance involves improvements, either productivity or efficiency improvements to the system. And a typical example that I'm sure you're familiar with is, how can I increase the speed, the throughput, the response time, the computational speed of my software? So second type of maintenance, perfective maintenance. Now, notice, unlike corrective maintenance, this was not a bug. It's not an error per se. Number one is reactive. Oh, no, bug, fix it. Two, this is proactive. How could I make it fast? The user didn't necessarily ask for it to be two milliseconds. They're happy with five millisecond response time. But can we make a two millisecond response time? And wouldn't that be better? Sure. Example, okay. Go to Mac OS as our example here. Uh, Ventura <clears throat> is the latest incarnation. And I forget if this is 12. The Mac OS had been stuck at 10. That was the X. It had been stuck at 10 for a very long time. And they called each, they had names for each of their things, you know, islands and things like that, but they were always at 10 point something. So I think Ventura is a 12 or is it a 13? Well, regardless, Apple says, hey, we've got some enhancements here. We did some perfective maintenance, live text. Uh, on the Mac OS can recognize text in images that's pretty cool so you can grab text out of a picture a slide a video frame there are lots of new accessibility tools live captioning for audio content and they renamed their system preferences to system setting which makes perfect sense, but now I'll be looking for it. I won't find it because it's called system setting the last 200 incarnations of the Mac OS. So just a couple of examples of perfected maintenance. Oopsie. Third type, adaptive maintenance. In adaptive maintenance, our software now resides in a new environment. So somehow the environment changed. My app ran fine under OS whatever, but now that a new version of the operating system has come out, it's not running fine. Or some new hardware. My app runs fine with a mouse, a trackpad, or Speech recognition, not so much. So we need to adapt our product to a new environment. And typically the new environment is either hardware or a new underlying operating system. As an example, think about Microsoft Office, which now runs on Chromebooks. Chromebooks were never designed to have processing power locally they were just designed to browse the web but like everything else things morph and what M microsoft has done is they have an interesting model office 365 they have something called pwa progressive web app which makes word run in a browser with some other funny hooks that give it more of a desktop client feeling or flavor. So this, what Microsoft did with their Office apps, Word, is an example of adaptive maintenance. Huh. Last type of maintenance, preventative. You can also say preventive. Both those words mean the same thing. 
I don't know why. I just always say preventative. It's longer. But you can also say preventive. Get rid of the AT there. Preventative maintenance. Huh. In preventative maintenance, which is also proactive, not just reactive to a problem or a new environment. This says, let me think ahead and let me anticipate possible future issues. And let's think about and fix those now before they creep up. <laughs> now, if you're into automobiles at all, you know we do this a lot with cars. We do preventative maintenance. You change your oil every so often. People ask me, why should I do that? Well, there's lots of good. Well, won't it run with oil that's 200,000 miles? No, probably not. It's all going to gum up and your engine's going to seize up. So you change the oil before that happens to prevent a future problem. How do you do that with software? Wow, this is really interesting and fascinating. IBM, do I have this here? Yeah, okay. IBM makes a product that uses artificial intelligence to try to predict maintenance of software project products. For example, imagine we have some kind of web-based system. Does usage over time, when I take a look at my use of, usage curves, how many people are connected concurrently? How long are they spending there? What's the response time, et cetera, et cetera? Does that indicate a possible need for additional bandwidth in the future? And if so, how can I change my product today before the problem hits? You can see the advantage, right? If I wait until my website is overloaded with everybody buy, buying Taylor Swift concert tickets, please tell me you're not doing that, right? But rather than waiting until Ticketmaster gets overrun, if we can anticipate that beforehand and correct the problem, then people aren't making fun of us on Twitter. Yeah, that's good, huh? So these are the types of maintenance, and we're going to come back and discuss them. And it's very unfortunate that we won't have the opportunity to actually do this. Time-wise, we barely have time to even carry out the two projects, the individual and the team one that we did. If we had nothing but time, it would be so interesting to then go back and do some maintenance of these types to see what's involved. But the best we can do is simulate it, just discuss it, and then life is good. Whoa. So folks, thank you. If I'm gonna, after I am officially sign off and goodbye, I'll hang around here for at least two minutes. If there are no questions, then I'll probably sign off. But if you have a question or concern, um, hang in there and we'll get to those. I will have another guest speaker next time, another faculty member in the department, and I'm still trying to line up a couple of folks who work in industry uh, to talk to us too. And I apologize, it's just the way scheduling worked for everybody that it's all here at the end, but hopefully that was worthwhile to you. So thank you so much for your rapt attention. Teams, you need to get together because you need to get uh, sprint two set. If you got questions about those things, hang on, we'll talk about them now. But I will at least officially sign off so I'm off of the recording. Have a nice day. Have a happy Tuesday. I will see you all on Wednesday.